fast forward, I delivered that talk in April of 2019. Dr. James Tabor, good friend of mine, you guys know that we're good buddies. He writes me an email and he said, hey, December of 2019, I get this email from James. He said, we have to talk. There was an article in the Harvard Gazette, if I'm not mistaken, and it was about an author who had written a book. The, the guy's name is Hanan Tigay, and he wrote a book called The Lost Book of Moses, I believe is the title of his book. And it was about a Shapira scroll. So I read that we, Tabor and I both order the book, we read the book, and what we find is that Tigay assessed the information and came away with a, uh, he confirmed the scholarly consensus. So up front, I'm going to tell you, Neil, the academics, both in the, at the time in the 19th century, all the way up through modern times, the majority of them say Shapira scroll was a forgery. Well, here was one question that was nagging. I said, what did the scroll say? I'm curious. Right. Right? Because I hear you. You got all that. You say that you think it's a fake. Well, that's what they said. But what I want to look at the raw data. Yeah, I'm not an easy, conv you can't convince me easily. Give me the data. So I, I began to pour over it. And I found that the text from the manuscript. Now, if I can show you this. Show it right here. Yeah. This is a replica obviously and it's mm -hmm. not to scale it's a little bit big I bought it off eBay bro you sure. can you can get this off eBay but this is one fragment so the quick dirty of this is there were 16 strips of leather that were discovered in a cave in uh, 1878 according to the story by Bedouin now think about this Neil 1878 uh, actually it was discovered in 1865 yeah it's paleo so it's discovered in 1865, but in 1878, Moses Shapira, a scroll merchant, like he's working as an agent for the British Museum, he comes in contact with the, the Bedouin, comes to him and said, hey, you know, I got this scroll, you might be interested. So he buys the manuscript uh, for next to nothing. And he sends the transcription. So you, you've studied paleo. Yeah. So he begins with paleo, and he's transcribing it in modern Hebrew letters. As he does, now there are 16 strips. Now it represents two manuscript copies of what Shapira believed could very well be an ancient manuscript of the Torah. <coughs> Excuse me. So he takes this sends it to a German scholar by the name of Schlotman. Schlotman looks at it and he says, he doesn't have this, he has the transcription. He writes him a scathing letter. He says, Shapira, this is a forgery. How could you dare suggest that something that doesn't agree with our authentic Bible is real? Really, and what, what made him think that? Because it didn't agree with the canonical text. Really? Yeah, the 10, by the way, this does have a version of the 10 commandments, Neil but it's not the version you know. Really? Now, that shouldn't have been a problem. Why? Because in the Bible, all the fundamentalists should know this, in the Bible we have two accounts of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words as they're called in Hebrew, yeah. Aseret HaDevarim, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. You put those side by side, they don't agree. There's differences. Now this is supposed to be the words of God from Mount Horeb, from Mount Sinai. So, but Schlotman sends it back, sends back a letter, scathing Shapira and says, how dare you? So what ultimately happens with this is Shapira feels bad, you know, because he wants to be a good believer and he puts it in a gold safe at the Bergheim Bank. He leaves it there and guess what? It stays there for five years. Wow. But then he begins to think. He begins to hear about the academic critical assessment of the Torah. He comes across a book that was written in 1860 by a scholar uh, by the name of Friedrich Bleek. Friedrich Bleek wrote a book in German. Germans are the best academics on the Bible, right? Yeah. So particularly in the 19th century. 1860, the book was written. He gets a hold of it in about 1882. And he reads it and he comes away with this startling conclusion and it's somewhat the same as what came to me. And that's this. The Torah, as we have it, the Pentateuch was not written by Moses or about his time. So Shapira then said, wait a minute, this might be authentic. So he goes back, he gets a scroll out of the bank, and he says, that's it. I'm going back to the European scholars, and I'm going to show it to them again. Now he's convinced, Neil.
He knows ancient scrolls. He knows old scrolls. Now here's the deal. This is 80 years. It was discovered 80 years before the Dead Sea Scrolls. Wow. So now Shapira brings it to Germany. And there's, so they yeah, don't even know ahead. that there's text that can survive that long. No, that's it. That's really important. That's the wow. point. Now get this. I'm going to tell you this piece. So in 1883, he's got the courage. He's got the conviction. He believes it's authentic. He doesn't care what they think. So he takes it to Germany. And by the way, he's got a couple of scholars. Most people that, that come on now, the academics that still say it's fake, they don't know all the background. Well, I they're just kind of they're just they're parroting what they learned in appealing graduate to the consensus, school. right? Absolutely. Right. So now I'm me, I'm in I'm into this subject. I downloaded every single thing that the PEF Palestine Exploration Fund did. I downloaded every article from the Athenaeum, from all the British papers, and and I read through the story and I recreate that in the book. But the fast version of it is this: He brings it to Leipzig, Germany, and in Leipzig, two young scholars by the name of Hermann Goethe and Edward Meyer, they look at this and they believe it's real. Nobody knows this. It's only in the German personal correspondence between these two. But he believes it's real, they believe it's real. He takes this manuscript, they, they transcribe it and they published it, and I actually read and used their transcription. Then it goes to England where David Christian Ginsburg, the great Masoretic scholar, he then transcribes it. So what I did, this is before I even decided for sure if I was going to write a book, I pulled those two transcriptions into one text, making a critical text for the first time. And I worked through it and I provided a translation of it. And you know what I found? Get this, Neil. Remember when I told you I was looking for what did Moses write? Right. Seven things that the, the Pentateuch says Moses wrote. Guess what this document contains? Those things. Those things that Moses would have written. Wow. Now, I took that and I said, now I'm not, I'm not being silly here. You know, I, I'm not just saying this is the scroll that Moses wrote, but I tell you what I do think. I think this gets us closer to the authentic, call it Ur Deuteronomy. You know, like, like the, the, first, the, the first Torah, if you will. Because, get this, it comes, it comes before all the priestly interpolations. If you would have, in the 19th century, if I were trying to create a fake, and I wanted to, let's say I looked at all the scholarly material and I said, you know, I'm going to fake them out. The one thing I would have put in it was chapter 12 through 26, all the priestly material. Because that's what a lot of scholars still believe that represents that's the, the earliest. Yeah. So that's what he would have done. But guess what's lacking in this? every bit of that. I mean, you're going to have to have me back. We're going to have to talk about the details of what's right. there, what's not there, and what does that really mean? Right. I mean, yeah. it, it's just amazing. Now, but I think this is a good um, breakdown of what this is. And as you can see, the last thing I want to ask you, and we'll, we'll, this is the last thing I want to end on. All right. What is it about this that they looked at and say, nah, this has got to be, like, what are they look? what are they seeing that makes academics say, this is a forgery? Yeah, you, you hit on one of them. One of them is, they, honestly, they just didn't know. I mean, if I were a scholar in 1883 and you told me, hey, Dr. Nichols, we found a scroll and I said, tell me about it. And they'd say, well... So the story is it was in a cave, uh, kind of near the Dead Sea. And, uh, and I'd say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It was near the Dead Sea? And, and you tell me that this is 2,000, 3,000 years old? There's no way. Almost without exception, the scholars of the day said, there's no way that a leather scroll could survive in a cave. But now we know that's, that's now not we true. Now we know, but listen, wow, it gets that's better. Kind of a couple more things. One that you'll hear all the time, it's repeated like people are zombies. They say it's non-provenance. Okay, makes sense. And the reason that these scholars say this, we don't want to encourage antiquities theft. We don't want somebody to say, hey, look, I got some antiquities, but I can't tell you where I got it. I mean, that's just bad business. And, right. it, and it encourages theft. So I get that. But here's the deal. They said it, there's no way it survived. It wouldn't have survived. Now, let me tell you a couple more details quickly yeah. that go with that. Number one, the leather, and, and I'm still working on some of this. This is a replica again. It's, it's a little bit bigger than it was, actually. Sure. But it was letter to letter, back to back. It was coated on the back with an asphalt-type uh, coating. 
And, and so notice the asphalt's never going to touch the letters. This is the paleo writing. But it did over time bleed through. But we believe that it was done for the purpose of keeping it flexible. Now, whenever it was also, they found it, it had linen stuck to it. Now, when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had linen stuck to them. So this is they the had same. asphalt. And not only that, written in paleo. Before, same thing, yeah. But before this, there was nothing ever found written on leather in paleo. I got the, this. Is, this is going to be a tough question right here. Yeah. Does any of the Dead Sea Scrolls have those dots? Yes. They do? Yes, they do. Wow. So you were so looking I just wanna, at I just, for, for anyone who has no idea what I'm talking about, in, the, in this text, there are these dots yeah. in between the words. Right. And a, a lot of ancient Hebrew doesn't do that. There, there are no dots Look, in between. Here, here you go. Here's right. an example. It, here, yeah. here. Here. And so scholars saw that and said, that's later. Well, what they actually said, it's worse than that. They felt like the forger was copying from lapidary, from stone inscriptions. Here's what they knew. They had the Moabite stella, the Mesha stone. They had that and they saw there are dots between words. The Siloam inscription is discovered in 1880. It had dots, but they had never seen it used on leather. So they said the forger is trying to play like he knows about ancient writing. Right. Well, now we know, Emmanuel Tove says that at Qumran, there are 13 manuscripts written in Paleo-Hebrew. Just like this. Yes. They, they are written in Paleo and they have the word divided. I'm not, I got to say, this, I'm con the you're, forger this is wouldn't very know. convincing. He wouldn't this know. This is very convincing. He wouldn't know. We're going to go deeper into this, and you can check out part two of this video on his Patreon. And I want you guys to shoot it down. Yeah. That's what let's, I want. I don't want people to think, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe it. Look at the evidence and see what you think. And you have just attained true gnosis. What is it that's shocking, maybe, that we find in there that we don't find in our Bible? The whole thing is shocking. Let me give you a couple of quick examples. Number one, the ten words are different, okay? The Ten Commandments. First of all, you, everyone knows who studied, if you study religion in general, how do you count the Ten Commandments, right? They're supposed to be ten. They're called Aser and Hadevarim. They're supposed to be ten. How do you count them? The Catholics, the Jews, the Lutherans, everybody counts them different because they're trying to make ten. And, and they just can't get there. And then you have Exodus and Deuteronomy don't agree. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 don't agree. And then some scholars propose that Exodus chapter 34 is an ancient priestly version of the 10 words. Some propose that Leviticus 19 is a different. This one is unique. Why? Because it doesn't match either, but it makes a lot more sense. And I'll build on that.